We're basically going to have a conversation, um, and we'd start with kind of just introducing ourselves, and then the last 30 minutes, we actually want to open it up to everybody and ask some questions and just kind of have a dialogue with the entire group, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to introduce yourself first? You go first. You go first? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> um, Hi, I'm Carol Williams, Carol Roshana Williams. You won't find me if you look me up under Carol Williams. There's thousands and thousands of me. Um, I actually am a visual painter. I've been painting in Seattle for almost 20 years. And I primarily paint um, topics and content based on race and social justice and climate change. Um, I also am currently the director at Gallery 110, which is in this building, and the program administrator for the Historic Central Area Arts and Culture District, um, and the co-founder of Artifacts, and the co-founder of Race and Climate Justice. Um, let's see, I think that's probably, that's about it. Yeah. I'm Beverly Ahrens. I am a writer, a freelancer, journalist, um, short story writer, novelist, playwright and I do some screenplays um, and write video games or work with a team to create video games. I'm also involved in a myriad of things. I'm an advocate for women. Um, I am on the Renters Commission and um, I run several community groups here, actually two community groups here in, in Seattle. And what else am I missing? <laughs> And these conversations, we, Carol and I end up having these types of conversations. All the time. All the time. <laughs> so we just, the last time we ended up having a conversation like this, we said, we should just have a talk with everyone, <laughs> you, you know, who wants to join in. Right. And so here we are. This is our first discussion. And um, like Carol said, we'll start the discussion. Then we want you guys to, to join in. Okay. All right. Well, let's start with the first question. Sounds good. Which is the, the pivotal question, the question that was on the flyer, what is black art? So what is black art? Well, it's like a loaded question, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think there are so many different ideas around what black art is. Um, for me, Black art is larger than the word black. Um, mm -hmm. It's larger than a cultural context. Mm -hmm. um, I think, for me, it, it embodies action. It embodies um, not only what we traditionally conceive of to be as black art, and I think some of those conversations that we've had have been around um, the concept that especially as a visual artist, a lot of the stuff that I see um, that traditionally is deemed black art has a lot to do with content in terms of imagery um, that reflects African-American culture, mm -hmm. um, past, present, and future. Uh, but I think it's much, when I say it's bigger than that, I think it actually, also encompasses um, environmental concepts and topics and how that plays out in the real world. Um, yeah, I think, I think I'm going <laughs> to... I, I, I think I can agree with you on a lot of that. I mean, when I think of black art, I think of art that is created by anyone of African descent. Mm -hmm. And that art may or may not reflect um, cult specific cultural contexts. You know, it may not, um, you may not be able to look at it and say, this is a piece of art that is created by someone who is black. You may not read that book and see, um, the book may not be specifically about someone who is black, but it could still be black art because it's being created by someone of African descent. Um, I also think that that is a new concept mm -hmm. 
to a lot of people because um, if you're not creating something that specifically is reflecting blackness, you know, a book with black characters in it, or a piece of art with a black person in it, people will say, oh, that's not, that's not black, you know, but it is. It's, it's something created by black artists. Right. And I think that's kind of the definition that I'd like to jump off of is mm -hmm. anything that is produced by a person who happens to be of African descent, right? Um, I think there was a time when it was relevant to have artwork that was actually representative of African culture, and I think that is still really relevant, don't get me wrong, but I think that part of the, the challenge around defining black art is this concept that we are so much more mm -hmm. than our culture, right? We're mm -hmm. also what we think and mm -hmm. how we walk in the world and um, how we grow in the world and mm -hmm. what that means in terms of historical perspective for me um, when I think about climate and I think about um, environment, it's directly related to race. And mm -hmm. so for me, painting those topics, it harkens back to that concept that um, we wouldn't be here in the first place and having to grapple with this paradigm, what is black art, if there hadn't have been something that happened, right, mm -hmm. to place us in this context in terms of having to say, now, this is the definition of black art, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that kind of like puts us into our next question. Before I say that, if we could leave that door open because it locks. So if we could, yeah. Um, and people won't be able to get in. So that kind of takes us into our next question. Why is it important? You said we're in this context now where we need to like define what is black art. Why is it important to ask what is black art? You know, why is it important to ask that now? When you think about why, what do you think? I think it's important because as an artist, I find, as a black artist, I find that I can become very limited by other people's definitions of what black art is. Um, I had a situation some years ago. I was writing, I had a very popular short story that people really loved in a publishing company that I don't want to name, saw it. And um, they asked me what the race of the characters were in my book in my short story, and I told them that they were white. And they were like, oh, okay. And they didn't want to buy it because there was no benefit, right? I wasn't being, I wasn't writing about the things that I was supposed to be writing about. I, I was writing um, about characters that just happened to be white. But do we actually want a, a world like a Jim Crow art world where black people can only write about black characters and white people can only write about white characters. But I don't think that we live in that world. I think we live in a world where black artists are actually expected to do work around black characters and yeah, absolutely. black identity, um, whereas other cultures can paint us all they want. That's true. <laughs> and write That's about true. us all they want and, and make movies on us all they want, right? right. right. Um, and, I mean, I had a similar experience as well um, where I was told that my art didn't have enough people of color that represented me and how could I become known as an artist without representing my African-American heritage. And it took me a couple of years to unpack that. And what does that really mean? Because I was kind of like, whoa, I, it kind of shocked me, actually. Um, and what I realized is that my mother's generation had to work really hard to actually have positive imagery of African-Americans. And so, of course, 
a lot of artists that came out of that time frame had to actually produce work that referenced things that we were doing in terms of sports and music and you know because these are like as a visual artist there's probably four or five basic content topics when you go and you look at african-american art and it all falls under there you know mm -hmm. um and so when i started to really unpack that what i realized was that there was a reason why that happened and yes there's a purpose and there's an intention behind that because there were no images of african-americans 50 60 years ago that were positive images right um but I feel like my, with my generation and the generation that's coming up behind me, there are serious um, challenges that are occurring in the African-American community that I think really need to be addressed. And for me, one of them has a lot to do with our idea of capitalism and patriarchy and consumerism and these ideals stem from a colonial way of thinking and that way of thinking actually goes back to this concept that um, indigenous cultures actually were self-sufficient and were you know not consuming at a rate that we are now and so when I'm thinking about these topics around climate change and environmentalism. To me, it's directly, like I said earlier, it's directly related to race because we are now in a circumstance where, you know, I mean, everybody knows Central District is being gentrified and people are being displaced at a mass rate. And so I just, I mean, when you, when you ask me that question, mm -hmm. that's and, what I and think when you, of. And when you say indigenous people were not consuming in the ways that we are now. And when people say to you, your work, your visual art doesn't reflect your culture because it doesn't include people of color, or enough black people in it, or you don't have those images, you don't have that stereotypical look of right. your, your art. But really, you are reflecting that culture because if you look back at um, the indigenous African cultures it's the same thing it's not just in the americas but we look at uh people like uh the pygmies uh, the mm -hmm. various pygmy people um the maasai's uh different groups who are not quote unquote civilized they don't have cities they don't have city states they're not right. structured that way they're more respectful of the earth and they're not consuming on the level that you see in civilized societies. So I think that it's important for us as artists, whether you're a visual artist, whether you're a writer, um, a black writer, black uh, visual artist, to control that, to control that definition and to f push back because that definition limits our expression and our ability to create quality, genuine quality art that actually reflects who we are and right now in this moment, <laughs> you know? Um, and that kind of goes back into to the next question. What challenges do black artists face? What challenges? I, I would say that just like I said, the challenge is, is that there are people who, people, the people who, many of the people who control the, the gates, the gatekeepers um, to the publishing houses, maybe to the galleries, mm -hmm. to um, the newspapers, to the magazines, to um, all of those platforms are defining what black art is, mm -hmm. and when you pr you try to go through those gatekeepers, um, oftentimes you can get a no if your work does not fit into that um, framing. 
Well, and I think also what's happened is because of that framing, mm -hmm. now it's institutionalized, right? Mm -hmm. So now you don't even have to be a person that is not of African descent to promote mm -hmm. that framework mm -hmm. because right. now it's institutionalized. And right. so now everybody has this idea around, mm -hmm. oh, this is what black art is supposed to be. Instead right. of it growing and changing and being allowed to transition into something that yes. is needed for this generation. Exactly. Right? Exactly. I, I, you hit it right on the nail. I had a situation where um, a woman, I told a woman that I was a writer, and she asked me what I wrote, and I began to tell her. Um, I said, yes, I, I write science fiction, I'm a journalist, and she goes, Black Lives Matter. I said, <laughs> I said okay, yes. Um, no, you write Black Lives Matter. And I say, well, actually, Black Lives Matter is not a genre. And she was <laughs> like, but that's what you write. I know that that's what you write. I mean, so she had a, a, a narrative in her head based on the stories, the, the, like the single story. You know, right. Have you heard that? The single story, the dangers of a single story, right? So there's a single story about what a black writer is. Right. And, you know, the irony is as that, is that I have not actually written about Black Lives Matter at all. <laughs> not because I don't think Black Lives Matter. It's just not something that I've written about. Um, and there are a million writers out there writing about that, right? right. And that's, that's what they do. But that's not what I write about. And, I, and, and that's fine. And I, I think, but it's not fine to the world out there. So if you're not writing, or drawing or singing the way people think that you should when you're black, um, you can run into a problem, mm -hmm. you know? I think that's a challenge. And I also think it can be a challenge like when you wanna go get funding. Right, oh, it's huge. Yeah, it's huge. people don't wanna fund you, you know, because your work is in black. Right, or what the definition of that it, is. Exactly, right? and so that's, that's a huge challenge, right? right. right. Yeah. Um, and I also think another challenge that I've seen, um, because this is where the difference, and, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, the difference between our art forms is that painting can be um, expensive, right? Mm -hmm. It can be, um, I mean, you have to have materials to do the work, right? And so I recognize that I sit in a place of privilege just in terms of that, that I have the resources to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, what I see a lot of the challenges being is that you have, a specifically in the African American community, people that I know that are fighting for the same pot of money, which is a small pot of money that traditionally, we're always fighting for a small pot of money, right? Mm -hmm. um, and not recognizing that there's an equity piece there, that access to resources in my community are a lot harder. Mm -hmm. um, and even the concept of, how can I put this? So my mother, here's a great story, my mother told me, don't be an artist. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I don't know if I can't not be an artist. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's actually possible. <laughs> I think it's something that I just, I have to do, right. you know? And she said, well, you're not gonna make money at it, you know? And I said, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know that, I'm very concerned about the money aspect. I said, for me, it's more about education mm -hmm. and um, really being able to have a place in a world that guides, guides conversation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, but what's so interesting about that is that once I actually did become an artist mm -hmm. and I entered the art world, what I realized is that there were no teachers that looked like me. Mm. There was no history around African American art mm. in college and, and um, I was fighting to find information. Mm. And it's only recently, probably the past five years, that I've even seen three books that are specifically about African American art. Mm. Um, and that's really new, like it's really new. Um, there may be books about individual artists, but there's no comprehensive like historical perspective, right? Mm -hmm. um, and 
because art's not in our schools, our youth are not getting it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost like this compound effect mm -hmm. that we're being told by parents not to go into the art world mm -hmm. as a visual painter. Um, I don't, it, you may be able to speak more to writing, but, um, and then entering school, there's nobody that looks like me. Mm. Um, and then entering the art world, I'm coming across this border wall, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. <laughs> where there's this, if you're not doing this type of work, then you're not this, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. that's the challenge that I see, that it's a systemic challenge, that it's actually not just a this or that. It's a this and that scenario. Yes, I, I agree it is um, in terms of like direct resources and money, what have you, it's a lot more expensive to be a visual artist. If you want to be a writer, it's cheaper, but what writing does cost is a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So when I wrote my novel, it took me about 150 hours. I tracked it. Um, and I think for a lot of black writers, that's a challenge because mm -hmm. if you, you're dealing with lower incomes in many cases because you've got the educational system that may, that is not necessarily producing um, people who can enter into the professions and earn more money. Right. Uh, you have people who have children. Um, they don't have time to do anything uh, extra because they're watching their children. You have people who are working jobs, two, three jobs right. to survive. So you have all those things, and that's part of that is race, part of it is class. Um, I, I think that with... I think that the other aspect of that is that for writers, for black writers, it can be difficult to get attention. Um, How so? People don't want to read books about black people. That, that's been personally been my experience, is that if you're trying to sell books, say you're, you're self-publishing or something like that, it can be very difficult to get, it has been in the past, very difficult to get uh, attention on those books from a wider audience. It's like people are just like, oh, that doesn't have anything to do with me. Um, because, so this is the flip side of like writing about black characters. Right. Um, is that, oh, that doesn't really have anything to do with me. There's a narrative that people have in their head. They don't feel that black stories are universal stories. So they may not read those books. And that's been my experience. Um, so you have, that can become a problem if you're going through a traditional publisher, even if you're self-publishing, because you have to make earn money right. uh, on, on what you're doing, because no matter what, it's still an investment. The, uh, in terms of seeing black writers, the first writer I ever met in person was a black writer. So it's kind of like a different um, <laughs> experience and also I think because I, I grew up in Chicago right. and you grew up in Tacoma right? right so that may be a very different um, experience because when I lived in Chicago I, I attended an all-black school um, elementary school and um, I, um, I attended an all-black elementary school. I'm like distracted by all this kind of drama going on. So I'm like, we could close the door just a little bit. Yeah. I don't know if it could, if we could prop it open. Maybe yeah. that yeah. might be. Yeah. So I attended an all-black school, and um, this was like in the the 80s, right? So I need to give like context, like the 80s, like late, yeah, early 80s, late 70s. So people, you know, had all the great black people who were doing great things currently in mm -hmm. the past on the wall. So these were like things that I was constantly surrounded by this. We read black authors. They even had a, a children's author, a black children's author come in. She shared my name. I don't remember what her last name was. <laughs> Beverly something. And she came in um, and talked to us. And she actually sat down and talked to me about being a writer, you know. So, um, she was the only writer, the first writer that I met, 
And I ended up being a part of the Chicago Defenders uh, Writers Apprenticeship Program. So at 14 years old, I started that. Chicago Defender is a historically black newspaper, probably one of the oldest black newspapers in the country at this point. So that was a very different experience in terms of, yeah, I was like, my first teachers were black. Mm -hmm. So in my school, every, all my teachers were black. The person who taught me how to be a journalist was black. So that's, that's, that's kind of, I think that's also a difference in personal experience. I don't know if, mm -hmm. how wide that experience is for other black writers, like how common that experience right. is for other black writers. But I think that once, as I've moved out from childhood, not as, I've been out of childhood for quite some time. Um, well, according to, you know, some people may disagree now. <laughs> so anyway, um, so once I, so I think geography really matters because I've, I lived in LA, I lived in Atlanta, and so those places have very, like very robust right. black communities. So you, there's an ecosystem of black visual artists. Right. Um, we, there was this place in Atlanta that was the U Gallery. Right. U Gallery is owned by a black guy, and he put up all the, the black artists, but you know, at the time, Atlanta had a huge black right. population. And so there was that experience, but when I moved here, it was a different experience. Mm -hmm. So I came here seven years ago, and I um, have been involved with the writing community, and that community is like almost completely white. So, I ex so I've experienced both things, right. you know, and I think that it is important to have a community that really reflects um, diverse perspectives, or right. that or that community can become stagnant. And right. um, well, and know. I think for me. Like growing up, so I grew. I went to high school in Tacoma, and my high school was extremely diverse and um, primarily all people of color. Mm -hmm. um, but yet, and still, we didn't have teachers of color. You mm -hmm. know, I think we had one African American teacher, and he was mm -hmm. like a health teacher, mm -hmm. right? But everybody else was white. He was like the only teacher, um, and I didn't really come. When I went and um, I got my bachelor's in fine art at Evergreen, and my first art teacher there happened to be of Asian descent. Mm -hmm. And so that in itself, I think, was a challenge, you know, mm -hmm. that I grew up in an all black community, but art wasn't. I think when you're dealing with issues of equity, and issues of um, growth in terms of resources. Um, sometimes art in certain venues becomes a way to express yourself mm -hmm. in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, and depending on what the medium is. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I too, I also grew up in the 80s and we had a lot of really powerful, positive black role models mm -hmm. then um, that were, you know, producing amazing music, strong mm -hmm. power women music, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. salt and pepper, and like, <laughs> I mean, we had some good stuff going on, you right, know, and yeah. now I feel like there's something that's missing in our culture mm -hmm. in terms of who can we look up to, who mm -hmm. do we, like, where, where are our role models, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and that are not manipulated by the media. Mm -hmm. And that kind of <laughs> that's the, the next question. Yeah, that's like that takes us to the next question. Like who defines right. black art? Like right. who who gets who gets to define black art? Right. Right. So who does get to define black art? Well, I think because that we live in a capitalist society, money defines what that is mm. at this point. Um, and I could be wrong, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it just, I think that we can get sidetracked um, because we live in um, a society, according to me, so this is my belief system, and I know that everybody doesn't believe, everybody don't, doesn't believe this, and I'm open to other people's opinions and the way that other people believe, but I believe because we 
grow, we are all growing up in a racist society that everybody is racist to some degree. I do not believe that, you know, you're not racist, I'm not racist, somebody else isn't racist, da 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 da. I think that everybody to some degree has some shred of racism and it's on a spectrum. So you have the really, really <laughs> racist national, you know, whatever. People who burn a cross on your lawn racist. <laughs> exactly right. Drop a bomb on your country racist. <laughs> And then, and then you have the other. <laughs> the unintentional racist? I don't know <laughs> if that's even a, a phrase. Um, so, so when I, I'm thinking of like, the fact that we are already predisposed mm. in terms of how we view the world, right? And how we're supposed to view the world. And then you have lay, put all these other layers on top of it that we just talked about mm -hmm. um, that with those layers, if the people who are making these mediums haven't experienced equity, right? Because that's class now. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different layer that's on top of that. Um, what's the story they're going to tell, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. what's, what's the actual story? And what's interesting to me is I haven't seen the movie Black Panther, but mm -hmm. I'm going to bring that up mm -hmm. because I was walking in today and there was a newspaper on the bench outside as I was coming back from walking my dog and somebody had left the newspaper there folded with the black new black panther it said new black panther family i think that's what it said on new, the in the, news in the newspaper it was something like that but it had the the image mm -hmm. and I, for once like i feel i don't even know how to explain this i felt really proud mm -hmm. just by the image. And the reason I felt really proud by the image is because every single person in that image represented the black folks I grew up with, right? right? right. Natural hair, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My skin tone, actually right. my skin tone, right? right? right. Um, and resilient. Right? right? I mean, and, and for me, just I was just walking by, I was like, oh my gosh, that's just the beautifulest picture ever. It looks like my family, right? Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. I had this concept that this is in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Is this in the newspaper because... <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's some type of hitch or right? it's not really exactly. as great it's as it, they it, say exactly, it is. Or, right? So now right. I'm going to go see the movie tonight because I have to see, right, if, it, if it's actual <laughs> representation of, like, <laughs> or is it a spin? <laughs> well, you know, I did see Black Panther and um, I agree with you. I mean, it's been a long time for me since I've looked up on a screen and seen black people who look actually look like black people on that screen. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. dark hair, mm -hmm. natural hair, not hair that's like got these big old curls. I'm talking about, you know, African hair. Um, and it matters. You know, it's, I've actually stopped going to see movies because there was just nothing there that ever represented me. I don't watch TV. There's nothing on TV that represents me, Sweet. right? And it's just like the, there's no point. And so I actually hadn't gone to see a movie in a very long time, but I used to be a huge film fan. I used to, actually I majored in film, um, and but I, I think after so many decades of seeing, not seeing anything representing me or very little, it just I just lost interest. And so when I uh, went to see the Black Panther, I was like, oh. So it's, it's not a scam, you know? It is actually, actually does have black people in it. it. There's no white, there are no white saviors in the movie, saving black people, right? you know, the whole white, you know, the whole trope. The white person enters poor, destitute black person's life and saves them. <laughs> this is like, this is like every, almost every movie out there with a black person in it. That's how I feel. It's like, that's the movie, that's the story, you know? Right. But it wasn't that which was actually shocking to me because um, so many movies tell that narrative. Right. Um, so- Well, and I think that actually, 
when, when we're talking about the media, I think for me, one of the most critical and important messages I wish that they would tell is the fact that part of the reason our communities are considered resilient is because we have the knowledge. We are whole, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> right, as we are, right. and we actually do have power in our mm -hmm. own right. Yes. But because people enter our communities thinking, oh, they must need to be saved or helped or you know whatever, there's this other ideal that comes in with that thinking mm -hmm. that can be damaging. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that, I actually think that that's related to who defines black art because I think that sometimes, and I don't, I don't know the whole history of like who produced Black Panther or, you know, or mm -hmm. any of that, but sometimes when you have to go through a gatekeeper who is not black, um, they may actually attempt to define black art for you, right. especially if they consider themselves to be passionate about black culture or black, you know, black people. And if you're not doing or perceiving, seeing things or doing things like they think that a black person should do, they will then correct you and help you be more like yourself. Right. But what, what I, the other thing I see is that now that you have some black people who are gaining resources um, and being able to produce their own works, artistic works, such as films, um, whatever, books, publishing companies, all those things, anything related to arts. They understand, like you said, that you as another black person are a whole person. Mm -hmm. They don't need that you, that you are complex. They don't need to tell you <laughs> what to create in your work, that what you're creating is worthy. It's black art because you're black and you're reflecting. There's so many things within the various black communities, whether right. you're African-Americans, whether you're Afro-Caribbean, whether you're from the continent immediately, from Africa, Nigeria, Gambia, right. South Africa, it doesn't matter. Those communities are bringing their whole selves, their ideas, their way of seeing the world, understanding the world. This is very important. Right. Understanding of the world to your work because that is what black art is. Like there's every, every group, every group of people, whether that's ethnic group or, you know, it could be class group, it could be uh, a group around a certain profession, doctors, lawyers, whatever, have certain ways of understanding the world. And when you create something, you share your understanding of the world with others. And I think that that's really important. I, I was reading someone's, a white man's comment about Black Panther, and he said that, it was interesting because he, he went to go see Black Panther and what he saw was completely different from what I saw. And, and he said that, oh, originally I thought that Black Panther was going to um, make a villain of the West and just kind of be all about racism and colonization. But what it really was, um, was about a, a black future that doesn't have anything to do with that. So I'm summarizing what he's saying, but I completely disagree. I think I felt like when I watched Black Panther, I, I understood it as set in present day. It was not, uh, that's how I, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I, thought, I felt like it was set in present day and that there was a look back, there was like a flashbacks to the 1990s. And it did comment on colonization. You know, it did. As a matter of fact, at one point, one of the main characters called someone a colonizer, right? And so, I felt that that was kind of an interesting perspective in the sense that he's bringing his understanding of the world to that film. And I'm bringing my understanding of the world to the film. Right. But he thought the film was great because he felt like 
all the other black films were just kind of like complaining about or really talking about how they were impacted by racism and impacted by colonization and that that was a bad thing or a thing that left them not whole or made them seem weird or whatever. But we're all impacted by colonization. Mm -hmm. We're all impacted by racism. It is not something that's exactly. unique to black people. Exactly. And when anybody makes arts, uh, works of art, that's reflected in that, whether you directly mention it right. or not. Right. So we're all impacted by anything that's happened in this society in the past or anything that's happening right now. We're impacted by it, whether we even realize it or not. So um, I thought that that uh, was interesting. And so I think that who defines black art is right now the people who, have, who hold the power to control distri distribution, distribution and, media or and any of that. exactly and control who uh, can see that they define who black art. Right. But then you have another thing, you have black, actual black people defining black art, but the wider society may not see that. Right. They may, so when they come across art that doesn't reflect that mainstream definition, it can be jarring. Mm -hmm. And I've had, like I said, I've had people correct me. Right. Black Lives Matter, yes, you're writing yes. Black Lives, she's correcting me, you know, about my own work, it's so crazy. But this is what, but it's so, <laughs> it's, it's so widespread yeah. <laughs> that she feels, she knows that what she's saying is correct. And she's helping me align myself right. with that correct um, definition in, to tell me exactly what I'm doing, which is the absolutely oddest thing I've ever seen. But she didn't see anything wrong with what she was doing at any point. And, but that is just a small microcosm of what's happening on a wider scale. Right. So, and that kind of takes us to our next question, which is, how does mainstream media define black art and why is that important? I think we're, we've kind of like been answering that. Yeah, I think we kind of got yeah. into that a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I just think it's, it's important on all different fronts and I think that um, not only is art, art on attack right now in our country um, with the current um, dismantling of the National Endowment of Arts and the e Environmental Pro um, Protection Agency and all these national um, agencies that are actually supposed to protect us and actually supposed to support us. Um, I think that this question about who has the power to define what that looks like is, is critical right now. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm all about collaboration and growth and inquiry, right? And critical reasoning and, 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 and thinking. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think art actually allows for that to mm -hmm. some extent. And I think that um, currently, I wish that there were more conversations about this mm -hmm. because it seems to me that um, we're not defining that, mm -hmm. you know? It's just happening, and, right. it, and it's happening without a, 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 a lens of questioning, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't, I mean, I don't know how to address that. I think that's one of the reasons why we decide to have this conversation. Yeah, we, Cause and, we're like, we're like, we want to open it up to a lot of people and yeah. have that dialogue, yes. you know? Um, yeah. I, I think it is important for the very reason that you mentioned. Um, the vast majority of people are depending on mainstream media to be informed about how they s understand the world. Right. So they turn on their televisions, they crank up their, I don't know, crank Music. up. Well, I was going to say crank up their internet. I don't know if that's, you know, do you crank up your internet? I don't know. <sighs> Maybe 20 years ago. Yes, yeah. So, yeah <laughs> you have to I'm, wait 10 minutes for AOL. Exactly. I had, yeah. I actually waited 30 minutes for AOL to, 
to to log in and I thank was, gosh we're not there anymore. I know exactly. That's but that kind of allowed me to multitask. So anyway, um, I think it's important because people are depending on those mediums um, to decide what is black art. Right. You know, um, black art for some people is. Um, very limited. It's rap music. It's hip hop. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with rap music, hip hop. No. But you know. But I uh, think rap music has been co-opted. There was a time when rap music had an intention and a purpose, and it was right. created out of that. Exactly. You know, but it was co-opted for the same exact things that we're talking about. Well, yes. And, and if you think <laughs> about the, you know, because there's that narrative out there, um, certain types of rap music. Is it's going to sell to the mainstream audience, right. while others are going to say, "Oh, that's not real black people," you know. <laughs> so that you have this type, of, it's like a conundrum because it's there's a narrative out there that the majority believe you can sell on something that fits into that narrative right. very easily, and if you don't fit into that narrative, you're going to be ignored. Right. So well, um, and not only ignored. I think ignored is mm -hmm. just the tip of the iceberg. I think that because I know a very I know actually a couple of very amazing painters, and they happen to be African American. And one paints basically French landscapes, and the other one paints a lot of figurative work, right? And it's not just people of color. Um, and I would expect that they would blow minds and sell at a massive rate. But part of the challenge is that they don't fit in this context, right, right. of what is supposed to be black art. Right. And so they have a challenge finding their niche, you mm -hmm. know, and we've had these conversations about, well, where do I fit? Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm on the fringe or I'm on the margin, a gallery can't place you, right? Right. right. Uh, uh, uh. And, a, and a publishing company can't place you either. Yeah. I mean, there were huge, for some science fiction artists, uh, writers, there have been issues of their books being taken out of science fiction and put in the black section because they were black artists. But their books weren't, <laughs> you know, they were science fiction. Their fans, the people who would read those types of books, wouldn't find their books because they have been removed mm -hmm. from science fiction because once they find out you're black, they remove you and put you into the black thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what you're writing about. And that is a serious problem. Right. And it has huge consequences, real consequences, career ending yeah. consequences if you're a professional artist. Um, if you're in the wrong section of the bookstore, you're not going to sell to the people who would want to read your book. Right. So, um, I'm sorry I interrupted you, but yeah. Well, no, I mean, and that is one reason why, I mean, it's interesting because I have um, an inner, I, I got into a residency, an international residency, and this is what I put in my proposal was that it's a challenge having these conversations in this country because <laughs> nobody is interested right. in what is black art, you right, know? Right. And they were all over it. They're mm -hmm. like, what are you talking, we want to know, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how is it that I'm getting more acknowledgement and clear, like, road internationally than actually in my own country? Because in this country, everybody thinks they already know what black art is. Right. It's, you know, hip <laughs> it's hip hop, <laughs> basketball, <laughs> Church, Sports, church songs, yeah. R and B, jazz, jazz, <laughs> blues. You know, it's like very, but we're constantly changing. We're constantly like jazz didn't always exist, right? Like if there was some type of like rigid definition of black art before jazz was created, it wouldn't have, you know, it would have been just ignored. <laughs> so we're, you know, every person, every human being is constantly creating something new. What is black art today? Um, it's, it's still going to be black art tomorrow. But, <laughs> you know, there is new black art being created. There's, like, Carol has amazing art about in, the environment, the earth, you know? And that's black art because the environment is important to black people. We care. <laughs> you know, it's really, and it's so funny because I've gone to, like, some environmental things and they're like no black people there 
And I'm like, black people are very concerned about the mm -hmm. earth. When I lived in Atlanta, um, I met many black environmentalists, you know, people who were writing articles and had entire series. I'm still on like newsletters and stuff. There was, a, there's a huge um, reserve, like maybe 200 acres, like some a massive amount of um, space that was purchased by a couple, a black couple called Sassafras mm -hmm. in um, Tennessee. People don't know this because they got a narrative in their head and they're, you know, they run, they're running this narrative because they can't see what's being created in front of them. They can't see what's happening. But blind people, environmentalism is very important to mm -hmm. black people. Black people Well, care. and it affects us directly. Exactly. Which is why I feel that it's so critical to yes. make this a part of the critical conversation, right? right? Because when we're talking about the, these, these environmental climate challenges, right. it's the communities of color, yes. the global south specifically, yes. that yes. is really directly affected mm -hmm. by energy, by, you know, hurricanes, by, mm -hmm. well, not, I don't know that they have hurricanes in the global south, but mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all the rainwater, the, right. all this stuff that we're dealing droughts. with, droughts and, Famine. you know, all of that is impacted it just, it's by it's all yeah. impacted and and are going to be the first affected yeah. right um, it's like in south africa in um not johannesburg in cape town they may run out of water yeah. um i think what happens is that in first world countries or what i would like to say the people with the most resources don't have to pay the price mm -hmm. for our environmental abuse of the earth. They don't have to pay the price. They can delay it because they're transferring that problem to um, other places. I remember. Uh, well, and I think it also goes back to what we talked about at the very beginning of this conversation around privilege that I think they also, we also, and that's why I acknowledge that like I am a, am a I am in a privileged place. But mm -hmm. the only reason I'm in a privileged place is because I live in TK, right? right? And so I can afford to do my art, right? right? And I think a lot of people don't see the back pieces around the like support. that part of right. it, the support, anyway. Yes. But I think that what you were just about to say, that goes back to this conversation that we were having earlier around privilege and mm -hmm. what does that look like, right? It can look like different levels of privilege, but right. privilege allows you to not have to look at certain things, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. And you, yes. if you do that, so there's a term that's out right now, it's called generational trauma. If you do, I would like to deem that as also, that's, that can be a generational, systemic way of walking through the world with this type of privilege that you don't have to acknowledge that, yeah, we're transferring and, and sending all our garbage over there, exactly. you know? I mean, and that's what I was just going to say. I remember visiting, my father is Jamaican. Well, he recently passed away, but my father's Jamaican. I was visiting Jamaica, and I remember sleeping in the front bedroom and um, smelling something burning. And I said, what is that? Well, apparently, people ship their trash to Jamaica to burn it, you know? Uh, and this is an import item, so, you know, to get revenue. Mm -hmm. So I think about that. I'm thinking, like, I would never think, I've never had in the United States ever had to wake up to burning trash because the United States is not going to, just allow someone to park a barge <laughs> out on uh, Santa Monica Beach or out here in the Sound and start burning trash because they don't have to, right? But when you're a poor country, you have to do things that you may not want to do so that you can get the revenue right. that you need, right. right? So let's move on to our final question, and then we're going to open it up to the community because this is not an audience we're going to have a <laughs> discussion and everyone's going to participate that wants to participate we're not you know trying to like force you to do anything um what is the future of black art that's a good question beverly yeah <laughs> what, is, what, is the, what is the future of black art you know um 
I, I see, and I just I, I have to go back to Black Panther. And the only reason I go back to Black Panther is because it's like the dominant movie medium thing right now, right? Um, that is interesting, and I and I haven't even seen it, but uh, I I feel like it's shifting. I feel like there's a lot of um, there's a lot of dialogue in terms of. I mean, I I feel like I'm trying to help shift some of this. Um, and 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 really bring conversations around um, equity. The fact that um, I, okay, so I'm gonna say this too, and I I do believe Black Lives Matters. Okay, <laughs> so I have a challenge with African American History Month. I don't feel like it should be a month. <laughs> I feel like it should be all year round, because I don't feel like African American History Month is just our, our history. I think it's everybody's history. And I think because we've separated it out, that it allows people not to have this conversation around all of us having our history together, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think there was a time when it was highly needed. Um, because our history, the, or African American history, is not in history books. It's not, you know, um, taught. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's got to be a way to make these things inclusive, mm -hmm. so that it represents America and it represents this this ideal and this concept that it's okay to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and that we should be having these conversations and not when we're 21 or 30 mm -hmm. or 40. Mm -hmm. um, that these conversations should be happening when we're younger mm -hmm. and, and as we're growing. Mm -hmm. um, I think I forgot where I was going with that. But that well, we were asking the question, what is <laughs> the, future. the future of so to black? Me, I guess that's black. the future. So that's the future, is, the future. Is, is what you're, it sounds like what you're saying is that the future is a black art is a black art fully integrated into right. the society so that the perspectives, outlooks, and paradigms, the ways of understanding the world that black people have are just part of the society, part of the story, the wider narrative that we're taking, right. that we're sharing with everyone. Right. And I agree. Um, I also think the future of black art is both positive and precarious. Precarious because precarious, yes. precarious because um, of a lot of reasons. One is that I think a lot of I think because we live in a capitalist society meaning a society that everything has a price tag on it, mm -hmm. even your housing. If you don't have housing, you can't pay for it out on the street. It doesn't matter if you're sick, doesn't matter if you're old, doesn't matter if you are a child. Right. Right. That is a cat what capitalism is. You don't have the money, you can't pay, goodbye. So we live in that type of society. And because we live in that type of society, if you want to survive, you have to constantly think about, can I sell this thing? Mm -hmm. And I say that black art is in a precarious situation because all the young artists coming up have to ask the question, can I sell this thing? Mm -hmm. And it can be risky to create something that's different if you want to be a professional artist, right? right. And it's, it's, it's kind of a catch-22 because it's the professional artists that have the time to really create right. the art. If you're a hobbyist, you don't have the time to build your craft. You can, it's hard to become excellent, right? So you need to be able to generate income from your work. I have faced that question. I have faced the question of can this sell, right? right? And I've tried to answer it by uh, being a copywriter and you know, working as a copywriter in creating um, books, stories, and what have you. I don't know if that's a complete answer Right. I don't think that that's the right answer. It's, it's, it's like a long-term answer. I'm not sure. Uh, I also have, 
I, when I first started writing my novels and stuff, I realized that, my, that two things happened. People were like really weird about the fact that, you know, I had characters that weren't black in my books. And when people didn't know that I was black because they would buy my books. Mm -hmm. Like I've sold more books under my pen name than I've ever sold under my real name. Because, and I believe that reason is because people don't know I'm black so they don't put those expectations right. on me and they just, go and look at it because they're just going to see a human being's work. But if they, if they know I'm black, they're not going to see a human being's work. They're going to see a black person's work. And there's a narrative around what that means. And they kind of like pull back from that, right? right. And that could be changing. I mean, people are constantly changing. Like the society is always changing. When I sat down and I was watching Black Panther in the most, most luxurious seat, I must say. It was like all reclined and everything. <laughs> what is this place over here, Meridian? I was like, I paid $20 for this seat and it's excellent. <laughs> so anyway, this theater was like filled with different people, like black people, you know, white people, Asian people, you know, I could see them, um, what color they were, you know, I came in and and I was like, wow, you know, and then the box office uh, income that the movie has generated is amazing. It's like the second biggest Marvel, it's Marvel, right? Yeah. Um, you know, opening dollars, right? Because it's all about dollars. Remember, back to capitalism. I thought, oh, maybe black art does sell. <laughs> you know, this is, this is, a, this is really, a uh, great, you know, this is maybe the iron, because stuff is constantly changing. There was a time when, I don't know if, I won't say remember, because you guys are pretty young. And, <laughs> but, and I don't remember either. I'm just pulling this out of the history book. But there was a time where black musicians, if they were going to like a record company, they would put a white person's face mm -hmm. on the, the, the record because nobody wanted to buy black people's music. So they would just put a black person's face, right. I mean, I'm sorry, a white person's face on their music and, and they would sell more, more albums, right? And obviously that doesn't happen anymore, right? You, some of the biggest uh, musicians are black and they don't have to put white people's faces on their work in order for them to sell. So anything can happen, anything can evolve. And I, I kinda, when I was sitting in that theater, I was just like, hmm. Black Panther is not a stereotypical movie about <laughs> black people. There are no white saviors here, and people are actually buying tickets to buy it. Shocking. I feel like something has shifted. <laughs> maybe I've got a chance, you know? Maybe people will, you maybe know? Maybe it's the future. <laughs> maybe we're in the future, right? So, um, <laughs> so that's what I think. I think that. You have things like Black Panther where people are like really, really excited. Obviously, it has the backing of a huge you know, company, Marvel, and it has a fan base. Um, I'm one of those fans. I love the best Black <laughs> Panther. I used to watch the little cartoons, and I wasn't a kid when I was watching them either. And I really liked you know, the Black Panther story. Um, and so you have that. You have that fan base. But even that um, is pretty amazing that you know a wide audience of people, a wide, diverse amount of people are interested in that story, and it's not some terrible, you know, ridiculous stereotype. <laughs> you know, where black people are not full people. So um, I feel that you have that. So you have the precariousness because you do have a capitalist society, and it's just like, oh, is this going to sell? And then you and you're faced with all these obstacles. And then you have things like Black Panther, um, who is doing quite well, you know, that is doing quite well, you know, this film, even though it is not falling into these stereotypes, right? Right, right. Well, I think also, I mean, I think the one word that you said that was really critical was precarious. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I think that that is a really important word when describing the future of black art has a lot to do with um, where we are right now, um, as as a community um, I think there's a lot of challenges that are facing our community right now um, and 
I don't know how that's going to play out, you know. Um, specifically, one is like the prison to pipeline system that is eradicating all of our black school males. School to prison pipeline. School, thing, yeah. school to prison pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, that it just is, I, I feel like there are these outside forces that are just like coming at our community at various levels and various different um, juncture points um, where you don't have time to think, right? And this goes back to the earlier thing around art. In order to be able to do art, you have to have time for it. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to, to build excellence in it, mm -hmm. you have to have time for it. Right? Um, and I don't know that our community not only has time for it, but specifically in Seattle, I know that our organizations are being dismantled and, and it's almost like, you know, the grains of sand in your hand and you just blow them and they're just going to the wind and where are people going, right? And so a com to have a community, you have to be connected and involved, right? If everybody's dispersed into different regions of the county. And, it, and that's how I feel, is I, I feel like 80% like of my friends have moved out of the city because they can't afford to live here. And so it's, it's, it's sad to me. It, mm -hmm. And how do you build your... I mean, things like, know? things like the Tashiro Kaplan Artist Loft. I mean, we wouldn't even, even have met, well, we met online, but right. we wouldn't, this, I don't know that this, what we're doing right now would have happened if I hadn't been your neighbor. Right. You know, and we didn't have those everyday conversations. So we need, um, in order But for, I think that's also new too, because is, this no. building didn't have a lot of people of color. And yeah. that's yeah. kind of like a social justice issue right now in the mm -hmm. building is that that's on the forefront. Yes. How do we get more people of color in the building, right? Yeah. Yes. And so I think these are the things that people aren't seeing behind the scenes mm -hmm. that um, we wouldn't be having this conversation right. if there hadn't been an art building, right? right? That right. supported us in being artists, yes. right? And so it's a full picture system. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about the future, that's what I'm hoping for, for artists that come out of the African community, African American mm -hmm. community, that we're supported in a way that really, that really looks at equity and really mm -hmm. looks at these other challenges, right? Because you can't just put us in a classroom and expect us to do art, but then mm -hmm. we can't get through to the other side. How mm -hmm. are we, you know? It's, if you don't have a place to live. If you don't have a place to live. If you don't live, have, yeah. you know. Medical resources, all exactly. that stuff. Mental yeah. health. Right. And if you're not going to a school. That, that values you as an yeah. artist, yeah. right? And That's the flip side And values you as a human too. being. You know, and values you as a human mm -hmm. being. And um, you're, it's going to be very difficult to do that uh, if you to have a future, right? Um, it's going to be very difficult to build a future, to become an artist, to support the arts. That's right. another thing. Like I, I was had this 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 fear. I don't even know if it's like a fear, but this idea that who is like when I'm writing books, um, especially to black people, right? You know. When I say two black people, it's, there are certain things that I write that are really very cultural specific and I know immediately other black people are gonna get certain things. And because of all these issues, the school to prison pipeline, um, also the exploitation of women and girls, mm -hmm. um, uh, especially black women and girls and the uh, um, flawed educational system, poverty, all these things, I thought to myself, who is going to read my books? Who? You know, if these, if, if all these people are in prison or, you know, there's so many people right. who are dealing with uh, a criminal record or dropped out of high school or was pushed out of high school, you got that too. Because mm -hmm. when you're being bullied or you're being made to feel that you're not 
a part of something that impacts you psychologically right. and you feel I don't want to be in this place and if you don't have the support you just leave you so that you have people who are not getting to that place where they become someone who will read books who will go to an art gallery who will go to a museum right. because maybe they don't think of it as valuable or if they do think of it as valuable they may not have the time or the resources right. one thing about i lived in france for a year and one thing that i realized living there was that it was cheap to go into a a, a museum you know <laughs> it's like five euro six euro and yeah. Here it's just like twenty bucks. Yeah, <laughs> and I think children many times got in free. Yeah, and so <laughs> you have these all these barriers, right? Yeah, art. I feel that especially having lived in another country for a while and having come back, and I mean really lived in it, not you know, off in some isolated place with other expats. I realized that. Here, art is a class thing. Mm -hmm. It's something that's enjoyed by people of a certain class. And that's a barrier, right? Mm -hmm. That's like... Um, well, and this is... this. I mean, this also goes to the fact that, like, a lot of agencies that get support are based on that mm -hmm. model, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That because we need to make money... Mm -hmm. We need to support the places that are making money. Yes. Whereas, it's nice to have a theater in your neighborhood. Right. That maybe the ticket is five dollars. Right. You know, where people can actually have access. Right. You know, right. the every average day person like the, that's the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of the things I'd like to also add to what you just said is um, it was interesting because so I got into a PhD program and it was an art. PhD program and I actually had to put my application on hold for a year because I was searching for money mm. and every where I searched there were no there was no money for black art mm. for, for for visual black art there mm -hmm. was money for music there was mm -hmm. money for math there was money for science mm -hmm. there was no money for black people to do art, mm -hmm. visual mm -hmm. art. <laughs> and yeah. it kind of blew my mind. And so I ended up not going to school because I couldn't mm. find money, you know, because mm. I don't want loans. Right. Um, but I was, I was really shocked by that, that at the upper echelon of society, if I have, if I, and why would I want a degree like that mm -hmm. now? I probably, I don't, you know, mm -hmm. but then I did. And I was thinking, oh, this would be great then I could sell books or then mm -hmm. I could do this, you know, and I was having that question, that mm -hmm. conversation in my head. How can I make money from this, right? Right. Well, mm -hmm. should that be a question of the future? Why should, I don't know. That's, I mean, as long know. as we're living in the capitalist society, it, it has to be, be a question. Yeah. So let's open, let's it, open up. it up. Let's yeah. open it up to the audience. Just tell us what your thoughts are. And, you know, I don't, if you have questions. If you have questions, but or I kind of wanted to, to make it so that it's not just people asking us questions, but maybe making comments or asking each other questions, you know? Please wait for the microphone so, so raise your hand uh, if you want to speak. Oh, and um, Katie will bring the mic, I got her name right. Katie will bring the <laughs> microphone to you because we're recording this, um, this, this event. Anybody have any comments, thoughts that popped into their head? Um, yeah, one comment, and uh, you mentioned that a little bit because you lived in France and I'm from Germany. Oh, okay. So I think uh, it's a bit similar, my experience moving here to the US three years ago. Um, for the first time today, I really understood a quote by A. Weiwei that I read once that said, art is politics and politics is art. Because mm. I think it's very closely related, right? Whatever impact you want to have on society and yeah the creation of art is a matter of politics mm -hmm. um, and then I thought about these different degrees of capitalism here in the US you have turbo capitalism and in Germany or in France you would have 
social welfare capitalism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we want to provide education um, we want to provide the ability for everyone to produce art uh, regardless of social status etc um, and this is what I'm missing here and mm -hmm. it's getting worse and worse as, as you mentioned right and yeah if, if that is not protected or if this is not improved there is uh, less and less of a chance for everyone to produce art which is then mm -hmm. yeah not the best thing to do for society I guess that's just yeah, what thank I thank you for your comment anyone else or questions or there's one over here and state your name too I think oh. with yeah okay this I'm Walter Hi. and uh, I thought some things that you were touching on were really interesting and a lot had to do with sort of barriers that are put up by outside forces the media and that kind of stuff and I think Broadly, all artists face that, mm -hmm. but I'm sure there's a lot of like cultural and economic factors also that make it more difficult, mm -hmm. uh, you know, depending on who you are, and also the ability to, uh, uh, you know, I've, I I knew an artist who did performance work that was uh, uh, kind of scary to some people, and when he started doing things that were not scary there was like a shift in sort of interest in what he was mm -hmm. doing and uh, you know so he'd been put into like a box and I think breaking out of boxes uh, and I guess you know in, in terms of the future uh, it's difficult for me sometimes to be optimistic but also there was you know I, I sort of lived through the 60s and there was a really explosion of creativity and mm -hmm. pushing boundaries and doing things that hadn't been done before and stepping out of uh, sort of these stereotypical roles and uh, I hope that that might happen again mm -hmm. I, you know it's mm -hmm. we're in a difficult situation right now but hopefully uh, there will be some barriers broken there, it, it, there were difficult times also in the 60s. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Thank you. Mark. I almost feel like we're going through a renaissance in this city mm -hmm. with black mm -hmm. art. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that are happening for the first time here in the past two years. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're starting to see a lot more African Americans specifically mm -hmm. <laughs> in positions of artistic power um, that I'm really excited about. But like I said, going back to this conversation around not only privilege, but equity, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how, like, I, I don't know if it's a fad or if it will be, if it's an actual shift in thinking and paradigm. Mm -hmm. All right, anyone else um, have a comment or question? Yes, Katie. I'm wondering, um, you mentioned something about distribution earlier and I wonder if you see social media changing that the landscape of the narrative around who is a black artist and what is black art is that an opportunity or is that a problem is it does it go back to the social media companies or is it how much how much power and control do people really have to shape that distribution and those narratives I think there's two fold things yeah, I think well, I think that there are a few things like there are many layers to that. Mm -hmm. um, one, I think the question we need to ask ourselves: Who owns the platform? Mm -hmm. The platform is a, a distribution one, right? Who owns Twitter? Who owns Facebook? Who owns Instagram? Right? Who owns it? Remember, we're in a capitalistic society, right? So that's an answer. Do black people own Facebook? You know, no, we don't. And actually, so that's, that's one answer and kind of like a question. And underneath that is that, yes, right now, you can get access to Facebook, to Twitter, to Instagram, and use that as a tool to promote your work, but you don't own it. Right. And that access can be taken away and has been taken away. And matter of fact, mm -hmm. I've 
I don't know about so much artists, but I've seen a lot of black activists get shut down immediately on Facebook mm -hmm. by Facebook moderators. And not moderators, but who are those people? Are they moderators? moderators? Who decide that your content is not acceptable. Right. Instantly, bam, right. page gone. You know, where uh, someone who's white can post certain things or, ha you know, and they won't be shut down right. as fast. I've seen, I see a lot of people complaining about that. Like I'm, my Facebook page, it was like locked for three months and I could really? not understand why. Mm. And with an organization that doesn't have a phone number or a way to get in touch with them, the only way I got my web, my Facebook page back up was that I literally wrote them a letter and mm. I said, look, this is my business page. Right. I need you to put my page back up. Right. And then within two weeks, my page was back up. Mm -hmm. um, but I, 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 and I don't know if it was something I said or did or posted or whatever, but I mean, I do time. Well, to, I've, you know, there have been campaigns launched you know. against black activists. I don't know about black artists so much um, by racist. Well, they will, you can report um, a page um, and it gets shut down. Right. So that has, I know that that has happened. Uh, I don't know if that's happened to black artists before, but people, there are a lot of ways to manipulate the system um, where life can be made difficult for the person that you're targeting, right? right? I personally do not use social media in that way. I have my own platform. Um, and I, two things that I do, I have my own websites mm -hmm. that I pay to have hosting and what have you. Obviously, I don't own the hosting company, but I, you know, if things went wrong, to just go to another hosting company, right? Um, they can't just lock my stuff and lock me out of it, right? right. Um, I also have a physical mailing list, which all of you should sign up for. Uh, if you sign up on those sign-in sheets, all, both Carol and I will have access to those names and we'll send you information. And I have, and I actually in, send out, sometimes send out physical information to people through the mail. So I, I'm really into controlling my platform because that's where the real power is. Mm -hmm. Facebook. Well, I think there is a little, so, so that's like, I think that's like the general rap all answer because there are particular um, groups, I feel, on um, social media that would not exist if there was not a social mm. media format or platform. Mm. Um, and one of those would be um, Spox. Is that, mm. So Spox is Seattle People Color Salon. And environmental professionals of color also is another. Um, but they have a separate they, forum that you that were if they had locked they're locked down. But they're going through Facebook. It's okay. a Facebook format, you know. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when I'm looking at it, yes, it would be awesome if it was owned by various people or whatever. Um, but because they do have their own platform on there and people and it's you know i don't know in that way i feel like i get support that i have not ever been able to get mm -hmm. um and i don't know and 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 also how can i say this so um i don't know if people have heard about caucuses before but yeah um Sometimes it's extremely helpful for people of color to have their own platform and be able to say whatever they need to say without being censored, without being targeted, without being marketed to, without, you know, and, and to be able, because there's not a lot of places where we can actually, except for family or a church used to be one of them, um, where we can go and actually mm -hmm. like say what we need to say mm -hmm. and, and kind of get our thoughts together and get support in a certain way. Um, and I, I feel like there are a couple of groups that are on Facebook that do provide that, even though they're not, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. they don't run Facebook, so. Right, right. Um, hmm. That's another question. Yes. I think with respect to Facebook and social media, the real key is to kind of 
game the system because it's pretty expensive to be able to have that broad a distribution and the ability to reach across distances. Uh, and, and you've worked to build up your own, you know, for instance, mailing list and so forth. But I've, I've become acquainted with a lot of artists in LA because of other artists that I knew in LA. Mm -hmm. And so they have this network. And the network is designed to sell stuff to people, but you don't have to buy it. You can still use the network mm -hmm. and make those connections, which have been valuable to me. And mm -hmm. so I, I, you know, and if everybody did that, they'd go away because they wouldn't be making money. Uh, so it's kind of, in a way, exploiting the system, mm -hmm. if you will. I mean, it would be almost better if your internet charges for just your connection just supported mm -hmm. things that were useful. And uh, I don't know how you'd make that happen or administer it, but because uh, it does take, you know, energy and machines mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and whatnot to be able to communicate on these platforms. But I do think so. That you're saying they have an actual physical network. That well, a network in terms of uh, yes. A physical network in terms of computers. Oh, in, okay. in other words, the, what what they're doing in terms of mining people's uh, uh, and and this was used. There's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of articles recently, and and especially just with the recent uh, uh, you, you know the Russian oh, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Mueller and whatnot. Uh, it, the, so there's a lot of information uh, in technical journals and, and, and mainstream now about how social media has been used to influence the 2016 election, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so forth. But those same techniques are used, the, they're really the same things as to sell people soap, mm -hmm. you know, and that's like soap operas, you know, on TV. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not necessarily really new. What's really new is they have uh, graphs of people, and so the way they try and get you to get on board with other groups or whatnot, you know. Uh, uh, it's very scientific, and I'm far from an expert on that kind of stuff or anything. Mm -hmm. But a again, I think, you know, as you found, it can be useful to be, uh, uh, you know, a, a part of some of these groups. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, but you don't want to go into it mindlessly, and right. you also don't want to go into it with the idea that they can't pull the rug out from under you. Right. Right. you know? yeah. right. But at least Definitely. once you've gotten those contacts, you can probably reestablish them on another platform if necessary. Right. And I'd advise people to you know, keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Walker. And I think there's um, one question over here. <clears throat> Yeah, I was just wondering, I mean, I don't want to get too technical, but there is this huge conversation around blockchain going on at the moment, where um, you essentially try to decentralize um, the power, um, right, and give autonomous organizations or entities the opportunity to circulate value and information without it being immutable by one entity of this organism. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly what you're getting at, right? Um, mm -hmm. If you if you leverage that technology or any other technology that allows for you to do that and to exchange information, whatever you as an organization consider appropriate, um, I think that's a huge potential in the future for, for any group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else? You have something to say? You want to share something? You got a question or something like that? No, you said quiet. All right. <laughs> any, anyone else? Got some people in the back that came in. Question, comment, protest. Maybe not. <laughs> well, we're at time too. Yeah, we're pretty much at time. Um, is is there anything you wanted to say? Um, I just want to thank everybody for coming out and having this conversation mm -hmm. with us and um, yes. allowing us to have the conversation yeah. as well. Yeah, this was. I really felt like this conversation was great because it allowed us to kind of think about out loud what the this issue or this this question and also share it with you and maybe get you thinking and also the comments that some of you made um, were, were very insightful and really I'm going to be thinking about I know a little bit about blockchain and and about social media how I can use it without it becoming like some <laughs> deadly, you know, kryptonite thing around my neck, <laughs> you know, where people can just do me in or whatever. 
when they get a chance, when they want to. Um, so Let's thank you. For the best. Yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> and so thank you so much for coming out. I appreciate every last one of you. If if you if anyone didn't get a chance to sign the release form, okay. So if you didn't sign the release, you, Linda, you, okay. Okay, so, it's on the table. Yeah. On your way out, could you please sign one if you haven't had a chance to? Sign? And also, if you get a chance, if you can sign the sign-in form, and you will get on our mailing list. And take a look at the lovely art by Carol Prashana Williams on the walls. Do you have uh, some stuff? That's it? That you don't, I thought you had shirts. Oh, no. There's okay. posters if you want to yes. buy a poster. Yeah.